Welcome everybody um, to what is session four on the Scientists Warning Europe Planeting Crisis Sustainable Economy Day. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, we've had a fantastic set of talks so far covering quite a few different topics and we've got one more fantastic talk coming after this. Um, as it's the Sustainable Economy Day, we are reading out the section from the World Scientists Warning of a Climate Emergency, um, which refers to economy. Excessive extraction of materials and over-exploitation of ecosystems driven by economic growth must be quickly curtailed to maintain long-term sustainability of the biosphere. We need a carbon-free economy that explicitly addresses human dependence on the biosphere and policies that guide economic decisions accordingly. Our goals need to shift from GDP growth and the pursuit of affluence towards sustaining ecosystems and improving human well-being by prioritizing basic needs and reducing inequality. Now, both the original warning, so the warning in 1992, signed by 1,700 scientists, and the second warning in 2017, echo that, um, but that was much clearer than those. And this last warning now signed by more than 15,000 scientists. So on that basis, I'd now like to introduce Mattis Wagonil, um, who's going to be um, talking on One Planet Prosperity. Now, Mattis Wagonackel has a PhD, and he co-created Ecological Footprint Accounting. He founded Global Footprint Network, a think tank focused on bringing about an economy in which all can thrive within the means of our one planet. His awards include the 2018 World Sustainability Award, the 2015 IAIA Global Environment Award, and the 2012 Blue Planet Prize. We're very, very pleased to have him here. Thank you so much, Mattis. I know it's early for you um, in California. And thank you very much for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much. Actually, we're a little bit late. We're not early. That's the problem. <laughs> but let me share my screen and thank you all for joining. Um, let me see, is it working here? Oops. Share, let me see. Good, here we are. Thanks for being here with me. So let me go get to a presentation. And as Ed said, just uh, please add your questions to the chat and then we can shift the conversation accordingly. I'd love to talk about just the idea that actually the choice is not so much about environment versus economy, but really about choosing between design or disaster. Because overshoot, the idea that we can or the, the reality that we use more than what Earth can renew will end whether we like it or not. The question is how. That's why we say let's shoot for one planet prosperity. But before starting, uh, just let's go, let me see if actually, okay, let me see if the controls work here. Uh, let me, let me, uh, bring up something most scandalous. Some of you may know Justin Bieber. And here I'm going to tell you the most scandalous part of his life. He's born in 1994. And if you add up all the fossil fuels ever burned in humanity's life span, during his life, 48% of all that fossil fuel was burned. If I look at my life, I'm born in 1962, 81% of all the fossil fuels ever burned were burned in my life. And that's just to illustrate that the situation or our dependence, our enormous dependence on fossil fuels is not normal. It's normal for my life. I haven't experienced anything else, but in terms of the human history, it's a very extraordinary time frame. And that leads also to a question saying, okay, how should we react to it? Because one impact obviously is climate change and, 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 and I wanna just make an analogy to another kind of a problem. Let's assume you're in a boat and you start to recognize, wow, there's a little cloud coming, storm is brewing. You realize your boat is not very seaworthy. What's the best reaction? Is it to have international gatherings and say, okay, who should 
fix their boat first? I will not fix my boat until everybody else is fixing their boat? Seems to be a rhetorical question, but it's strange even that we have to ask this rhetorical question because ultimately we do as if we are kind of unable to act unless everybody else acts. The reality is the storm is coming. We see the storm coming. We know our boat is not strong. The best thing you can do is to fix your own boat. And that's where the analogy also breaks down because if everybody fixes their boat, the storm will become much weaker as well. So in some ways, I think our self-interest, our skin in the game, the reality that we are in the game and not just observers is far more dominant than what we hear generally in the conversation where we think, oh my God, I cannot save the planet myself. Let me do nothing. I'm going to wait for others to act. Now we have entered a totally new era. Back in the old days, our economies were small compared to what the planet can renew currently. We live in an overly filled world, and that's changing the dynamics of everything, including our economies, just that we haven't fully recognized it yet. So how is it changing it, and what are the implications? That's going to be the focus of my presentation. Now, many of you have heard of planetary boundaries, ecological limits. There's so many conditions necessary to make life thrive on this planet. Stable climate, we need to have enough water, uh, we shouldn't pollute too much, not more than ecosystems can break down again, etc. So all these conditions are necessary to be able to regenerate life. So we would call the main outcome is regeneration, the rebuilding of life, the replenishment of biomass. And we use that as the lens for looking at the world of saying ultimately regeneration is the most limiting material factor for human life. And so it becomes our lens. And when I say regeneration, I mean obviously the biological assets like timber, food, etc. But also fossil fuel, of course it's limited on the ground, but even more limited it is by the ability to burn it by how much waste the biosphere can take from fossil fuel burning. So we have found already far more fossil fuels than the biosphere is able to cope with from a waste perspective. And even with minerals and metals and ores, etc., ultimately we can always dig deeper holes, but digging deeper holes takes energy and destroys ecosystems. So again, the ability to access the minerals and ores underground also is limited ultimately by regeneration. So that's why it's a useful lens. Now, what do I mean by regeneration? I hope you can see this little video. It's kind of the yearly production of the planet. It looks like a pumping heart. When you look at um, temperate areas, you can see how in the winter, the temperate areas disappear. The tropical areas, like for example, Yucatan in Mexico stays about the same size all year round. But this is the productivity of the planet with its seasonal fluctuation. That's what gives us life. Now, let me just structure it a little bit more, organized by land types. We then start to realize that about 24% of the planet's surface capture most of the regeneration. That's where most life happens. On the rest is life too, it's just not very dense, not dense enough to harvest. So 24% of the planet surface, that's basically our budget. It's 12.3 billion hectares of ecologically productive space. And so you can say every 12.3 billionth of the planet's biocapacity is captured by an average hectare that is productive. And that becomes our unit. It's like economists that think about money flows, they want to have a common unit, they may use dollars or they may use euros or they may use pounds as kind of a common unit of measurement to translate all other economies in the same currency. We use a physical unit called global hectares, which represents the average productivity of the planet. So if a hectare is more productive than the planet, it's counted as more hectares. 
If it's less productive, it's counted as less. Now, how much nature do we have? How much do we use? That's then becoming available. Like the, what's the income, so to say, we call that by capacity. What's the expenditure? That's what we call ecological footprint. And um, it's a simple accounting part. So we have looked at how much we have. Now let's look at how much we use, the ecological footprint. Here, just a picture that helps us to remind us ourselves that everything we consume has to come from somewhere and takes ecological productive space. So all the spaces that compete for ecological productivity, they can be added up and become our footprint. So let's put it in numbers. How much do we have? So if we look at how much area there is, it's 12.3 billion hectares and how many people there are today. Uh, we realize we have about 1.6 global hectares per person. And we talk about some of that also needs to serve wild species if we want them around. Then we can compare it with how much we use. We use 19.2 billion global hectares currently. How is it possible to use more than what you have? It's like with money, you can spend more than what you earn, not forever, but for some time, as long as you spend down your assets or go into more debt. That's what we're doing ecologically. So overshoot is possible. Our demand this year now is over 50% higher than what Earth can regenerate. That's based on UN statistics. It's probably a, a conservative estimate because the UN doesn't capture all the demands and probably regeneration is overreported. We can go into that. Um, and it's a little bit down from last year, as you can see, because of COVID. Uh, so there, uh, so COVID has reduced things. And again, if you go to back to the idea of doing it by design versus disaster, that that reduction has been driven by disaster. This difference of use to what we, what, how much we use compared to what, how much we have is overshoot. And you heard the statement in the beginning of the scientist's warning. That's essentially the essence of overshoot they're talking about as well. Uh, that we can use more than what there is for some time and eventually it will balance out again. If you look at overshoot in different languages, many languages don't even have a good word for that overshoot. So it's like going to a doctor with disease. People don't even know, the doctors don't even know what the name of the disease is, but that's kind of the underlying driver. Now to summarize again, we use more than 50%, more than what Earth can renew. And we compare that with how much we may want to use. E.O. Wilson says to maintain a good part of biodiversity, uh, we shouldn't use more than half the plant's capacity. So we're about factor three above in our metabolism of what a healthy planet could sustain. We can also translate the 1.56 Earth that we use into a date, because if we measure like from January 1st to which date have we used as much as Earth can renew, for this year, the date was August 22nd. So. Do we still have beer in the fridge on August 23rd? Yes, we do. But it means we are living off depletion. So the idea therefore is how can we move the date? And we wanna move it, that means we move it. We do it by design all the way to December 31st and beyond because by December 31st, we just would use the entire planet. But as I said, we may wanna use less. Now last year, for example, Pope Francis read about it in the newspaper and uh, commented about it. And it was interesting to see that how well he picked it up. Clearly has a scientific background. So he was able to explain it pretty well. It's an easy concept that even primary student, primary school students can understand from January 1st to August 22nd, we used as much as our planet can renew in the entire year. Yeah. Apart from January, I think there's no, there's no, Two, uh, more than three syllable word in the, in, in the sentence, very, very simple. Now we can look at it over time. This is over my lifetime, I'm born in 1962. Uh, what it shows is that the biocapacity of the planet, according to the FAO has slightly increased because of increased productivity in agriculture. There may also be depletion and it's not captured, but demand has gone up far, far more rapidly, as you can see. And the impact is not just how much more we use than what the earth can renew, but it accumulates as a debt. It's like that your deficit every year, the pink part becomes the debt that is accumulated as a damage to the planet. You can look at all these numbers on our website, datafootprintnetwork.org, has all the numbers available. We'll be coming out with new numbers pretty soon. We are working with York University in Toronto on the next edition. Uh, 
here, just an example, you can look at it country by country. I just use one country that's kind of interesting because you see the contraction after the, uh, the contraction of the, uh, so when the Soviet Union disintegrated um, and the, the Eastern Bloc fell apart. You can historically look at interesting trends. Please go and visit the website. Now, what are the applications? Let me go, let me do two things, two applications that could be helpful kind of to build that bridge between the ecological reality and um, our economic risks. So one key question that we look at when we look, when you work companies or cities is the following. Are you committed to your own success? What does that mean? If you want to be around as a company, for example, the question becomes, is your offering necessary a necessary ingredient for humanity's long-term success. Because if it is, then you will be needed. If not, you're planning for your own obsolescence. Now, how do you know what that is? First, you may want to define what's humanity's long-term success. Some people call it sustainable development, or we call it one plan prosperity, ecological civilization. It's this tension between the recognition we have an ecological budget and we want to have great lives. This is the tension. How do we measure that? It's saying we need to measure these two tensions, the ultimate ends and the ultimate means. Now, one axis is the development part and saying, okay, how well do we live? Now, one measure could be the Human Development Index of the UN. It's not perfect, but they kind of have a measure between zero and one. One is kind of nirvana, zero is hell. Uh, and then we can have the other axis and saying, okay, sustainable means, does it fit within the planet's regenerative budget? And they can see number of planets and the other axis, how many Earth would it take if everybody lived at that level of resource consumption? Now, if you could put all of the countries in there, you can every, put every person in there, every city in there. You can also get a little bit more specific. You can see that, you know, that uh, there's this quadrant, I call it, you could call it one planet prosperity or just and safe operating space or sustainable development quadrant. It's high human development within the means of the one planet. You see this little earth kind of showing up. That's kind of thing. okay, let's have at least 0 0.8 HDI, high HDI, but also hopefully um, if we follow E.O. Wilson's suggestion, perhaps use half a planet, that's where ideally we should be on average. But on average, we are somewhere quite different. That's the other planet. So we can see that's the path we would need to go. Now, this means for every for example, for a company, there are two possibilities to be very helpful to humanity. Strategy A, strategy B, are you able to provide for human needs within the budget that is available? Are you able to reduce the resource demand to provide for needs in a way that fits within the means of one planet? If you're able to do that, your business will be needed more and more. You can learn more about that um, in a, in a ebook that we just produced called Strategies for One Planet Prosperity. Uh, if you go to our website at footprintnetwork.org slash uh, OPP, One Planet Prosperity, it leads you directly to this publication as well. It's very easy to find. Now, let me do a, a second economic case to kind of close the conversation, because ultimately I think the, 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 the misconception that we have in our societies is that often we translate resources into prices and say, well, how much do we pay for resources? We realize we don't pay that much. And so we think, oh, it cannot be that bad. Like there's a, like resources are so cheap, they're getting cheaper, whatever, it doesn't matter. Now, let me show you why actually it does have a significant impact. Let's start again from the graph that I showed earlier of how much we have in terms of bike capacity, how much we use in terms of ecological footprint as a total for humanity. And I'm just kind of making more space for the graph so we can also think about the future. It's the same graph again, just to make space for the future. And we can ask ourselves, how will the future be? Will the lines just continue? But imagine that the ecological debt accumulated over time now is already so high that even currently, our carbon concentration, for example, in the atmosphere is so high that we have already exceeded the budget available for reaching two degrees Celsius if we take all greenhouse gases into account. Methane, CO2, etc., all the greenhouse gases. So um, 
how will we move forward? I don't know, but for example, IPCC, uh, they call it the 1.5 degree decarbonization strategy, say they should, we should be uh, decarbonizing relatively fast. That would be the pathway of going to half CO2 by 2030. Um, and that still would add more ecological debt, of course. Luckily, it's going down. Uh, that's one possible way. Or we may not follow it, and then the debt would be even larger. But whatever pathway we take, what we know about the future is there will be more climate change. And also, there will be more resource constraints. Given that, like, whatever the pathway will be, and we don't know, what we do know is that with every decision we make is actually an investment. We may invest in things, and many things we invest in have a long life. Whether it's a new power plant, and that could be a windmill, the new road, the new building, the new photovoltaic system, somebody being born also, they will be around for a long time. So decisions today, they will be around for a very long time. And what we're starting to see is that the lifespan of investments that we are uh, that we are making today is entering a phase of ecological, I wouldn't say uncertainty, because actually there's certainty around that there will be more climate change and resource constraint. So the question becomes, will these assets be helpful in that time or not so helpful? So it's not a bad thing that they will be around for long term. But the question is, if they're very resource intensive to operate, like for example, an airport, they most likely will lose in value in such a future. And those assets like a very energy efficient house, very well located, will gain in value because people will want to live in a comfortable house in the future. So the distinction becomes very clear, right? Which ones are gonna be helpful? Which ones are not gonna be helpful? So if we translate that into economic value, it's a double risk that we are facing. And with double risk, it makes it even worse. So the first aspect is, as I mentioned, will what you have be more valuable or less valuable? And if somebody loses value, it's not just bad for that person, it's bad for society because there will be less opportunities for society. So will you lose value? But then the even bigger risk is the following. You will lose the value at the time when the economy is already weak. It's a bit like falling down and as you fall down, you thought there would be a mattress on the floor and the mattress is being pulled away. So it's losing value and losing it at the worst time. So we shouldn't ask so much, what's the value of nature? The question is much more, what will be the value of our economy if we do not have nature to support it? As an example, you may have heard of Cape Town running out of water about a year ago. It just barely escaped. So they didn't pay that much for water. But the value of the entire city vanishes if there's no water to operate the city. So it's a, so that's the, the, the way we have more helpful to look at the question. So what are the lessons? The lessons are pretty simple. Plan ahead. Actually, we know much more about the future than we give us credit for. Use your hands and your brain. But essentially, we use the hand to say, there's so many opportunities where we can increase well-being and shave off overshoot by design. Obviously, we can make the planet stronger, ecosystem restoration, regenerative agriculture, etc. There are ways to, to, to use to, to, to make biocapacity stronger. And then there are four demands that are overlapping to some time, but they kind of cover the whole thing. How are we organizing our cities? Because the way we organize our cities defines how we move around, how much energy houses use, etc. How we live. So city design, how we operate cities is important. How we power them, obviously. Do we power them with coal or do we power them with solar power? How do we eat? Food now occupies about half of the plant's biocapacity. And how many are we? If we're twice as many people, obviously there's only half as much biocapacity per person. Uh, 
Uh, and the way population shifts, I mean, it's not that rapid, uh, but over time it accumulates as well. Like, so how many people will there be in 2100? Um, if we had reproductive rates, like for example, in Portugal or Spain today, we would be about at 3 billion people by 2100. So in essence, I think we need to recognize that the transformations is not just a noble thing to do, it's a necessary thing. I like to liken it to brushing your teeth. You know, brushing your teeth is not a noble thing. It's a necessary thing. You just do it every day, even though it doesn't avoid cavities today, it's an investment in the future, but you still do it because you recognize it's necessary for you. Same thing with sustainability. That's the big lesson. Thank you for, very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to more conversations. If you like to cruise the world, uh, you can do it from the safety of your home now. <laughs> and without spreading COVID, just go to data.footprintnetwork.org. Look at all the countries, how they're operating. It's quite fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mattis. That was great. So, um, Maybe once people have had a chance to take down those, um, make note of the, um, the email and that, we can move off the, um, the screen move off, share. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, we haven't had many questions yet, everybody. So come on, let's have some questions from people, please. There's plenty of people here on this talk. Um, I would like actually, Mattis, maybe I'll just pick up straight away with a bit of a comment actually on almost your last slide where you talk about, um, you know, we brush our teeth because it's necessary. Um, and we know, because we've all been told, um, that it's an investment in our future because our teeth won't fall out. Um, I, when I've been speaking about climate change, tend to use a, a similar, if slightly more extreme, um, version of the, the same sort of thing. And I, I tend to, to say to people, and I, and I say this really about the World Scientist warnings, when we see that 1,700 scientists issued a warning 27 years ago, which was then repeated by 20,000 scientists two years ago, and repeated again by 15,000 scientists a year ago. And um, to me, that's very much like the doctor telling me that I go to see him because I'm sick. And he says to me, well, Ed, if you continue drinking and smoking like you are, you're gonna be dead within a year. And I, because I'm fairly stupid, I continue smoking and drinking and just put my head in the sand because I'm enjoying it. And six months later on in failing health, um, much worse than I was before I go back to the doctor. And the doctor says to me, Ed, I told you, and I'm telling you again, you'll die in six months time if you don't stop smoking and drinking. Still not believing it. Um, I go off and I go off and get an expensive doctor, which in the UK would be in Harley Street and pay a lot of money for an hour's conversation. And he tells me exactly the same thing as my NHS doctor had told me, that I'll die. Um, and at that point, it seems to me that most of us, five of us would probably give up smoking and drinking, four might decide to be have a smoke and a drink on a Saturday evening or something like that and one might be bloody minded and continue but we would all actually take a decision on it and that what's happening is we aren't taking a decision um, and yet we've got warnings not just from the IPCC but in terms of, um, of the scientists warnings 20,000 of the world's doctors on climate have told us we've got to put this right now or we've got a serious problem so I totally agree with your your way of approaching it although I have a slightly more extreme version of saying it um i think yeah i, I, I think the where the analogy possibly make break down a little bit is to, i think that too many people believe they're not in the game they're just observing it that it's a tragedy outside they're watching and it will barely affect them so it's not so it's not that they are smoking or they're drinking but they know like there's too much drinking and smoking the world but somehow they are shielded from it they're shielded by high incomes for example and what we saw with covid is that covid broke that barrier too i mean it's like even high income countries got covid and even high income countries didn't have enough masks and I think with COVID, we learned it a little bit faster and still, I mean, I'm a little bit disappointed how little we learned <laughs> from COVID. But we, 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 I think we recognize the best way to save others or to, to contribute to any success is to protect yourself. You know, so if you protect yourself, obviously you're safer, it's good for you. And also that's the best thing you can do for society. And with somehow strangely, I mean, for example, the UK, you're on the UK. I think 
people quickly and happily talk about independence, but we forget that it takes four times more than what ecosystems in the UK can regenerate to support the UK island. You know? So where does that come from? Will you always have a financial advantage over the rest of the world as more and more people want more and more overshoot is growing? Income actually in other parts of the world are growing more rapidly. So, so relatively speaking, the British uh, or the resident is taking home less of the global pancake <laughs> overall. <laughs> And, and so how do you think you can always outcompete others uh, for, for getting those resources? That's kind of what, what is surprising. That's why I started with the boat analogy is to say that we continue to go to international meetings and negotiate with, with each other about what? Negotiate about zero? I'm not sure what we negotiate about. It's kind of why, what's the business case in waiting for others? I have no idea. Um, but that's kind of, I think that's where the, the, the narrative is falling down, that I think too many people believe it's what some people call the tragedy of the commons. You know, it's, oh, my goodness, it's so sad for humanity, but what can I do? And I think we need to start to see the storm as our context. It's not our problem. It's our context. If you are entering this storm, is London destroying London or is London prepare, preparing London? The question is not, is London helping the world, but is Birmingham, is Birmingham destroying Birmingham? Or is it preparing Birmingham for the future we can anticipate? That's, that's for me, the strange kind of narrative breakdown. Yes, and I, I mean, I want, so you're so right, and I want to go through these questions, but it, it comes out, the, the normal expression we hear in the UK, and, and I heard when I was on the, the general election campaign trail, um, and I, mm -hmm. I talked to people about climate change, and the first thing they would say to me is how much they hate Extinction Rebellion, but then would immediately start talking about climate change, which is a big clap for Extinction Rebellion. We've achieved what they wanted to. Everybody's got it at the top of their mind. The second thing they'd say is, oh, but if, if China and America are not doing anything, what's the point in us doing anything? Even the point then is even to do even more, because if you cannot trust others that they will do the right thing, then the future will be even more determined by climate change and resource constraints. Which means actually without international collaboration, the need for action, for your action, gets even higher if you want to be around. It's not, it's, it's a very, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that just shows they don't think they're in the game. <laughs> yeah. No, and uh, I mean, it, it was, it was. And, and, it's, and it's no, we are in love by being noble. Noble sounds so noble. It's actually noble. You barely do on Saturday afternoon. Barely. You know? If it rains and can't do anything else, it'd be a bit noble on Saturday afternoon. Um, but, but this is not this is a necessary question. You know? Anyhow, so I could go and ranting. Right? Well, that's great. Okay. I'll now read out a couple of the questions. So for Brian, uh, your global footprint network works on global, national, city, region level. Do you find it easier to gain acceptance at one country or city level than at UN level? I, 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 I mean, we have changed our strategy much more and say, who do we want to work with? And I think it's kind of the, our key criteria now is, do people see that they have skin in the game? We all have skin in the game. But I think, I mean, I'm glad the UN exists but it doesn't have as strong skin in the game to really resolve the problem because they will be around even though the problem gets worse. You know, there's no like, oh my God, if we don't get there by X, <laughs> we'll be dead. But I think a city administration should recognize if we don't get our city right, we cannot move our city. I mean, the, the time lag of infrastructure is much, much higher than the time lag of climate change and, 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 the, and the resource constraints coming. So they're already in a race. They are truly in the game. Some of them may not recognize that yet. That's getting in the game. It's interesting that the younger generation start to recognize it more. I mean, not universally, but but kind of the uh, I mean, the Fridays for Future activists or I mean, Greta is kind of Greta Thunberg is one of the <laughs> prominent spokespeople. I mean, she doesn't say, "Oh, let's be nice to the Mongolians." You know, she says, "Don't kill me." Like, why are we sending me to school to learn for the future, preparing for the future, but you're destroying the future? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So she is totally clear. It's about her. 
know, it's not just, I mean, she, she may not be totally right. It's such a threat to her. I don't know. I think she's probably more on the right side, you know, but the, but the point is she sees herself in the game and that's where she speaks from. So when people say, oh, are you a vegetarian? You know, uh, if you're not a vegetarian, you cannot talk about this. Like kind of putting it into the noble, moralistic realm. The young people say, I mean, of course that's important, but as society, we need to succeed. You know, if, if we discuss government debt, nobody gets into the question, have you always paid your credit card debt? You know, so are you a moral person financially? Otherwise don't talk about government debt. No, yeah. you know, so, 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 so we, we, we moralize the topic told them necessarily because and, and and by doing that we make it into a noble topic and it's not going to be resolved so so ask yourself do you have skin in the game or not it's not a, so, and if you don't have skin in the game just get out of the way i mean so and i think that's why i think our like i'm now in in, in the older ages like I'm, <laughs> I'm born in 62 i mean our role really is to be helpers of those who will steer the ship everybody born after 1985 will be in the workforce in 2050 and well before 2050 we should be able to operate without fossil fuels and i think even universities today are not preparing students today which are born way after 85 to be able to build this transition that there's no, like, if we want to have a, a good future, that's necessary. You just have the skills. I mean, they're, they're, they're becoming captains of Spaceship Earth, and they're getting no kind of instructions of how it even operates and how you have to operate it. it like, they're, they're, they're getting taught theories from 200 years ago when the, the Earth was kind of relatively empty of human uh, activities. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. So, so I think academic and educational institutions largely, largely, largely are still failing those who will have to kind of live with the consequences that is not that distant when, when we were at Brundtland is now 50 years ago nearly you know I don't know or at least uh, not totally 50 years but <laughs> nearly two generations ago and then they talked about the next generations now we're two generations beyond that you know so it's not like so so talking about this is about it's not about the future it's, I mean our time lag now is already like of our infrastructure already larger than the time lag of, of climate change we are in the game it's already we are already late in the game yeah. um, so so yeah and, and so, so I think that 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 narrative is just just, uh, just now noting that we have really maximum 10 minutes left of this talk because we have another one hot on its heels coming um, awesome. and I would just like to add um, a little bit to what you were saying in terms of and then get your comment on it, but probably asking because we've probably got quite a few, probably five or six or seven questions that we might get a very short answer to. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of having skin in the game, um, for me and for a lot of other people, and this was discussed in some other sessions, is um, it worries, it's a big worry that most leaders, be they business leaders, members of parliament, senate, representatives, uh, local councils, whatever level, don't seem to get climate change. And by get it, it's in that very sort of teenager sense of, did you, did you, did you get it? Um, get it in your belly, understand it. You don't have to know whether it's gonna to go to one and a half degrees, two and a half degrees or whatever it is. You don't have to have all the issues under it, but you really get it that you've got skin in the game, that this is happening right now and you have to take action. And that seems to be something that runs through all of the people that are leading us at every single level. Yeah. Okay. Uh, absolutely. And I think Esther asked a good question just about like, isn't it shocking to people or disempowering by seeing how much biocapacity is this per person? Like kind of, it's overwhelming yeah. or whatever. And so I think one important point I want to make is that we are not telling people what they need to do. We're just giving them context. I'm just giving them, a, I'm just saying, this is how much there is per person. I'm not even saying who should get how much. I mean, this is just what we have to deal with. So understanding your context allows you to win your bets much more likely because planning the future is about like betting. It's not a religion to believe it or not. And then we are in a religious war and the religious wars never turn out well. It's not a religious war. It's information to help you choose most wisely for yourself. And by understanding the context, it most likely also bodes out well for everybody else too, you know, so because it's kind of, you're in, a, in the context of everybody else. So creating value at the cost of somebody else, it's not a sustainable value creation. creation. It has to be something that actually everybody thinks is more value. That's true value generation. Um, otherwise we are, in a, we are in a Ponzi scheme or in a, in a, in a, in a pyramid scheme, I don't know how it's called in the UK, where, which we are actually, we are, we're de destroying the future 
to pay for the present and that cannot continue in the long run. So somebody will get a haircut, you know, so, yep. so, so prepare yourself. So it's not about scaring or it's kind of giving context so you can make a choice. It's not pushing you into something. You have to accept that or I force you to do that. It's actually helping people to be the captains of the spaceship or of their own lives in some ways. And yes, so, so our numbers, I mean, they may seem stark. It's an agricultural view of the word. We say like every country is a bit like a farm. Like how big is your farm compared to your hunger? Uh, and, and we're using UN statistics to not be like the ones who pick data nearly willy from left and right. We just say, this is kind of the official data set. And indeed the data set, as Bill points out, just still says like, oh, the biocapacity seems to be going up, even though we're having so much destruction, maybe it's a total exaggeration. So we think the, the, the overshoot that we estimate is probably a conservative estimate, probably it may be larger. And even, even with all these conservative assumptions, still we are running quite a significant deficit. And I think what people have a hard time understanding also is even during overshoot, it's still possible to increase demand. It just means then kind of the tension gets even bigger. You deplete even more of the future buy capacity that will be needed as our budget in the future. So, so, so the faster we transform, maybe it will reduce short-term income, but the bigger it increases our wealth. And I think that's the big misconception that people distinguish not well between income and wealth. If we generate fast income, if you generate a hundred pounds of income, but it costs you 200 pounds of wealth that you don't account for, you think, oh my God, we produced a hundred pounds of income. <laughs> like I, I sold my, my family the jewelry or I, full, I sold my furniture. You know, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not true income. It made you poorer. If we don't see that, they actually are misconceived. So the sustainable transformation is the highest opportunity for value creation. Okay. Um, going on to a question from Tony Goodchild. Sorry. Why or how does the Earth's biocapacity appear to be increasing with time? Hmm. So the way the UN capture things, we look at how much area is biologically productive and what are the yields that are being reported so that we use at face value. Uh, we, we should also increase, include in the accounts if the numbers existed, how much like how much is degenerated because of soil loss, for example, or groundwater tables going down, how, like how much regeneration would it take to kind of build that up again to not have that and then include that in the in, in the equation as well if we have those data points they don't exist consistently so at this point it's mainly driven by higher yields in agriculture they're not all everywhere getting higher in some places they're going down again uh, but still and, and, and also forest yields are not very well monitored over time so when we just use all the data sets it seems it's slightly going up uh, not very rapidly, but demand is increasing far, far, far more rapidly. Like even in this, so so it, the increase of bike capacity has been about 20 to 25% over the last 50, 60 years, according to this rapid in, uh, intensification. Um, and, but demand has gone up like twice or something, you know. Okay. Um, just giving a comment now then, two more questions, I think, with short answers. Mm, okay. so coming from Margaret Beasley, Matt is spot on that most people think they're outside of the problem. I, I think they find, I find they think it's my special interest, meaning Margaret's, and it's difficult <laughs> to explain that the existential crisis relates to them too. Um, Will Saunders asks, and probably a very 30 second answer, please. What's the biggest hurdle at the moment? Um, I think it's the narrative, as I said. I think the, the, the biggest, my biggest wish is let's never say should again. <laughs> Just say I want, because if we say I should, we should, it never happens. People say, oh yeah, we should, therefore I, you actually help that it doesn't happen. Just say, I want, what do you want? I want to live in a city without cars. I want to be powered by the sun. I want to live in a world where everybody has equal rights. I want, and that becomes you. And then, and if people get excited about that, it's gonna happen. Very good idea. And I think we've got a very good example with our Brexit campaign in this country is pretty much that's what the Brexit is said, I want. So, uh, okay. Um, is there one parameter that's most effective at reducing the footprint? This question from Mark. So is there one parameter that's most effective at reducing the footprint? Yeah, let's say I want, not I should. Right. Okay, <laughs> right. okay. let's see if we can fit in one more question then after that. Um, all right. Okay, we'll, we'll read this one out, I think. It's then maybe have your final comment and then we'll close. One of the reasons the public doesn't get activated is that there are scientists saying it is only a consumption issue, not a population issue. How can we encourage scientists to compare their assumptions, data, et cetera, so that we can talk off the same sheet? 
then our message is more clear. So maybe a quick comment from you. Yeah, yeah we are looking at the world from, we call it resource security. And then that all factors come into that, you know, so like with the UK to say how much is the UK use compared to how much the UK has resource security, I think needs to be far more central. If you want to have a competitive future as a country. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mattis. We'll draw it to, to a close there. And um, just to say that going on this, um, instead of saying we should is I want is we have actually with scientists warning Europe, although we're science driven. We recognize right at the start that it isn't about talking more about the science and about what should happen. It's about how we communicate it to get the action. So we have actually started to create a, communi a communications advisory panel specifically Wonderful. to focus on that, not just on the science. Um, and, and I think actually as well, when people quick keep mentioning um, which is the most important factor, the world scientists warning to humanity mentions six factors. You know, it doesn't distinguish between them and they're all interrelated. So nature, food, short-lived pollutants, energy, economy and population, and they all relate to each other. So it's not a question of ducking on, on any of them. They, they all are there. So, um, right, everybody, um, thank you very, very much to Mattis. That's wonderful um, from California.